Bosch LE electronic fuel injection, which was an improvement because it had the ability to sense the exhaust gases via an oxygen sensor, O2 sensor, which I'll get into that in a second, thereby being able to um, fine trim its um, calculations of fuel, which were based on mass airflow. So we've still got this nasty old airflow meter, uh, calculating the flow of air, calculating the um, temperature, um, coolant temperature for the engine, and we're calculating the mass. So from mere mass, um, we know how much uh, fuel to put in, or make a, a reasonable judgment, and then this oxygen sensor can provide a feedback loop. Now, um, that was better, but the problem is it still had this nasty airflow meter. Um, and it also had this nasty old, uh, this dirty old uh, air uh, bypass meter actually warming up. So it had no um, active uh, idle control or throttle control at this stage. Throttle position indicator. Um, that's the uh, bypass regulator that goes on the fuel rail. A vacuum goes to it here and uh, at idle conditions when we've got uh, a high vacuum at the injectors um, we uh, don't want to get too much uh, mixture because um, flow across them is proportional to the pressure differential um, going in and going out so if we've got a higher vacuum we lower the pressure and that vacuum present here allows the pressure from here to actually go back to the tank and bypass it so when you're testing it you should uh, check for a vacuum and pull the vacuum signal off and watch the fuel pressure go up or down and um, make sure that it's actually um, turning on and operating at idle. The problem with the airflow meter is it's still got this door which not only restricts the air but it also um, has a great lag on it simply because of the physical time it takes to move. Um, the signalling to the um, ECM is still um, using the sweep method where it sweeps over a bunch of segments each, each segment has a little resistor there in it, so the, the computer just reads each segment and the resistance of each segment um, just to check the airflow meter is basically working, but it still relies on this sweep arm, which is, which is nasty. Uh, but the main thing is the lag in the, uh, in the throttle door and the method of simple um, air mass flow. Now, with motorcycles, first one to come out with this one um, came out with a with a system that actually used one of these and I was working in a Kawasaki dealer in Western Australia at the time one of these uh, um, came along and we checked it out and the, the throttle was just it was insanely laggy and um, the throttle control was not was just not good it was carburetors were way superior um, they made a considerable change in the next B2 model. Uh, this was the bike. It was uh, a nice bike. It was fairly similar to the uh, Z1000J model with the carbies before that, which was a great bike. Um, the shop I worked at uh, at Hartley's um, ran a suit bike in the Z1000J and um, won many, many races. And uh, yeah, it was a good bike. But um, when it came out with this fuel injection, uh, it was nasty really nasty and there is the uh, offensive airflow meter that it had in it instead of a B1 GPZ 1100. So the performance of it for a motorcycle was not good and this um, left people falling over themselves to actually replace it with carbons um, which was um, basically the solution until the next uh, model came out and it didn't have an airflow meter and it used a different method of calculation of the fuel injection which I will uh, get to next well not right away right but shortly we'll just get into the um, oxygen sensor bit now into the uh, oxygen sensor lambda sensor O2 sensor it's been called various names depending on whether it's working or not essentially what this does is got uh, sort of precious metals inside there I won't go into it too much but it senses the difference in the content of oxygen at this side and the content of the oxygen outside and this one expresses a voltage um, proportion to the amount of oxygen that is in the um, exhaust gases um, that are close to the ideal stoichiometric fuel ratio now 
the voltage that's ex expressed from this is not one that um, uh, operates like a, a, a slope throughout the rich and throughout the lean range. Um, it doesn't actually calculate how much rich or how lean. Um, it just tells you whether it's it's lean or rich to one side or the other of the ideal fuel ratio. Now, also keep in mind, it senses oxygen. Okay, it doesn't sense uh, the fuel ratio, it just senses oxygen and assumes that if there's a lot of oxygen, it must be lean. And if there's a, a, a small amount of oxygen, it must be rich. And a small amount of oxygen produces a, a higher voltage output. So, um, what we uh, also have to keep in mind is, is that if there's any conditions in the engine that cause an oxygen condition, like an EGR open, okay, that maybe should not be open, then um, this will not account for it. It will assume that that is oxygen and that's the mixture. So um, that's why you've got to keep in mind that this is sensing oxygen. It's not sensing the fuel mixture. It's only assuming the fuel mixture is around the stoichiometric ratio because of the amount of oxygen that it senses. So we've got our oxygen sensor to provide some uh, feedback for this um, method of calculation, which uh, it um, is based on the, the mass of airflow, uh, the temperature in, you know, of the engine. And at this stage, um, it doesn't really need to know anything more from the ignition other than that it is turning um, and to uh, use the timing of uh, firing the injectors once every revolution. So all the injectors fire together they're on the same fuel rail, but they all fire together, wired, they're more or less wired in, in parallel, if you will, and they fire once every revolution, whether the valves are open or closed or what. Okay, and it's uh, particularly laggy on the on the air fleet air fuel, so that has a lot of fluctuation in it, and our oxygen sensor provides uh, some ability to actually trim that. So. Uh, at this stage, uh, we'll look at the oxygen sensor and how the computer reads and corrects for the oxygen sensor. And for that, we have to look at the actual output from an oxygen sensor. So we'll do that. What we have here is a graph that represents the output of the O2 sensor. And its full scale is 1 volt, 1000 millivolts. And we see that the slope does not gradually go from, well, sorry, down the bottom is our mixtures, so there's rich and there's lean, 18 parts air to one part fuel, 12 parts air, so it's less air, richer. You can see the scale as it gets richer, that's where the voltage goes, down and down as it gets leaner, and up and up as it gets richer, okay? So you'll notice that it doesn't follow a linear line down here, so yeah, we don't actually see or the computer doesn't see um, how rich it is or how lean it is along the slope in um, a straight line. And um, that makes it difficult to uh, adjust to it, um, but I'll, I'll explain that and the reason for this. And uh, essentially you can't read the amount of rich you are or the amount of lean you are because after the signal reaches its center point where it can actually express some difference between rich and lean so it's over a very uh, narrow range so between here and here in this area is about the only area we've got where we're getting any kind of slope that represents actually how rich or lean we are any kind of slope in voltage and after that point, it slopes straight off so much that it's um, virtually not usable, not readable. So it is a very sharp, a very sensitive uh, center point of sensing. And um, this, this slope um, is actually affected by uh, how hot the sensor is. So the hotter the sensor is, and it has to be kept up to heat, the more slope it actually has. So the area on this one um, would be um, sloping down earlier and then a little bit later in the slope. So then we would get a slightly wider range 
where we actually had a slope between one and the other when the temperature sensor, when the oxygen sensor is hot. So the early ones just allowed the exhaust gases to heat the sensor up, and once the exhaust gases had heated it up and they got to a reasonable uh, signal that it could use, uh, the computer would start using it. But that takes some time and short, lots of short trips. You, you know, it wouldn't get time to heat up. So later ones had a heater fitted to the O2 sensor and that would ensure that it heated up quickly and it would provide a, uh, a wider band of um, scale along the voltage range in millivolts. Now, um, that's one thing about the sensor is, um, is that it requires the heat to get a readable scale but nevertheless the scale is quite limited. Um, so for an example, if you were going to use this for a carburetor, um, you might read the sensor and it's just at 1 volt or 0.9 okay, or 0.8 or thereabouts. It's showing you rich, but it's not telling you how rich. So you decide, okay, well I'm going to go down jet sizes. So you go down in a couple of jet sizes and next time you check it, it's down here. So you don't know how far it is in between, whether it's halfway in between or not. So you go back one, um, one richer and it's still on the lean side. So you go back another richer and then suddenly it's on the rich end again. At this point, you still haven't got to the center point of actually where you want it to be. And you have to guess it's somewhere in between a larger jet and a smaller jet, which is going to show up at the ends of the slope because it's, it's, it's very sensitive. And uh, if I was to use one of those um, for that purpose, um, then I had to make the choice. Then I would obviously jet to the rich side, safety and the best power, but uh, the lean side, we don't want to be going on the lean side. So if you're using it to tune a Garvey, um, it would be um, useful to a degree, but you have to make a, a call in the end. Now, how um, the computer actually deals with this signal and the tight slope down here, I will get into that next.